Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to episode 66. This is not Max's voice. This is John Tucker. Our show tonight is about self-reflection. Max has asked me to read this note out to you. Hi, everybody. Please forgive me for not being here to do the show today. If you have been following me on social media, the physical pain, the pain becomes so intense that it is affecting my regular work schedule. I hope to be back next week after I try a couple of different things to get better. Until then, please be kind and respectful to John. Good for you, Max. As he pushes forward with the show, stay yellow. No, Max, that's right. However, what I did uh, is put the um, connections, the contacts for Zoom. We're going to open up the show a little bit tonight to callers online. So during uh, the first part of the show, I'll talk about self-reflection. We will do the mailbag. I'll use refer to several authors that I like to talk about these kinds of things. And if you want to jump into the show, you can click on the link. I think Max has got it in the in the bar below. But it's also if you look up and see my name in the live chat, you will see and the password. I made that note at six fifty. So people can call in. It's a live radio show. And on with the topic. Okay. First, I'm going to refer to a little slim picture book by Eckhart Tolle. Most of you know this guy. He's a, a very creative thinker. And he wrote a tiny book called Guardians of Being. It's a picture book. It looks like a kid's book, but it's not. It's a lovely book for all ages. He says, we get lost in doing, thinking, remembering, anticipating lost in a maze of complexity and a world of problems. Nature can show us the way home, the way out of the prison of our own minds. Now, isn't that interesting? A prison of your own mind. And that's what happens. We can be negative thought almost instantaneously if we get some way of doing that some way of doing that. Uh, I see, we already have somebody wanting to call in, that's great. Please um, sign in to the uh, Zoom and when we get through some of this stuff, we'll start chatting with folks. Okay, back to the prison of our own minds. Think about that, think of the ideas that have come to you uh, from a bad event or a bad set of events and realize that you're reacting to a current situation because of something somebody may have said a long time ago. And the something that they said disturbed you, it was unhappy, it was unpleasant, it was insulting or hurtful or dangerous. And it was you reacting to this current situation. That means you're a prisoner of your own mind. It's really tricky to cleanse yourself of all these old wounds and hates and stuff, but it's worth the effort. It's worth the self-reflection. You say to yourself, okay, I'm rude to this person. Do I really mean to be rude to this? Do I need to be? Wait now, that's just because of that other thing that happened a long time ago. The other point that is very important in this little quote from Eckhart Tolle is that nature can show us the way home. Getting in and going where it's green, getting into the woods, going where it's green. Go, you know, you're not going to find your way home in a big shopping mall. It's too distracting. And for several of the differently wired folks that I know, it's really, really rotten for uh, the senses to be surrounded by noise and all that kind of stuff. It's a good way to go. Another fellow that talks about reflection in terms of uh, learning to know yourself is Edward M. Holloway, who wrote Delivered from Distraction, a great book. He says, most important, know thyself. Know that you have foibles and gifts and that you need to engineer the environment to promote what's best in you. And you have to work at remembering 
what you know about yourself and continue to use it. Ironically, due to your ADD, you can learn, but then forget the very knowledge that will help you the most, the knowledge of who you are. So knowing yourself doesn't mean self-flagellating. It doesn't mean saying, oh, I know myself, I'm no good. I know myself. That, that's not what it's about. And a little later on in the show, I'll talk about some people who approach it a different way. So um, I noticed some people in the chat room are picking up on the notion of prison in our own mind. That's great. You can ask me questions in the chat room. You can also uh, line up in the, um, in the Zoom if you should want to. Now I'm going to turn to a text from Andrew Solomon, Far From the Tree. Great text, big text, who talks about a society. Um, a tolerant society softens parents Tolerance has evolved because individuals with good esteem have explo exposed the flawed nature of prejudice. Our parents are metaphors for ourselves. We struggle for their acceptance as a displaced way of struggling to accept ourselves. The culture is likewise a metaphor for our parents. Our quest for high esteem in a larger world is only a sophisticated manifestation of our primal wish for parental love the triangulation can be dizzying. So the struggle for self-esteem is like the struggle in society. Um, one, when I talked about prison for your own mind, I'm thinking of stuff that sometimes, you know, happened at home in the family, something that happened with parents. And some of the stuff is really hard to let go. And some of the stuff struggle to find. So uh, it's a good cause for self-reflection without self-flagellation. I'm kind of boring myself with reading, so I'm going to flick over to the mailbag for a second, uh, if I may. And I'll come back to this later. Uh, Skylar Rich writes, hello, Max and John. Your latest episode on finding motivation was very helpful for me and had a lot of things I needed to hear. Thank you both for having such a wonderful show for me to tune into. Lately, I have had an issue with finding my ambition or finding something I would like to pursue. Everyone says to just try things and maybe that is all I need to do, but it's troubling when there's millions of things out there I could try and I lack the resources to try them. Due to, COVID, due to the pandemic, my junior year of high school was canceled. So I basically have only one year of high school left and still zero clue what to do with my life. Should I wait it out until I find something? Or do I need to rush and find something ASAP? Apologies for the long email and thank you both for everything you do. Well, you're most welcome, Skylar. Thank you for the lovely email. Not too long at all. And a great question. When you're, um, when you're in school at that point, you're sort of nervous. What do I do next? What do I do with my life? Well, broadly speaking, you can't really rush because you may end up going down the wrong trail. So let's say there's a series of choices in front of you. I could do this or this. Maybe that's good too. All right, so you got these kinds of choices. What can you take in school what can you study that allows you to keep those choices in front of you? In other words, when clients of mine who are in school having this issue, I say, well, don't take a course of study or make choices that limit you. Like, don't go to this route where you're going to have to climb back and you have to undo everything. You, you entered this program, you did all this work, then you change your mind, now you got to start all over again. That's kind of sad to waste your time. So it's a good idea to keep choices open and 
one great, let me see, where did I get this from? Oh yeah, the parachute book. Um, when you're thinking of careers, you can do what um, Richard Bowles calls the information interview. For instance, let's say you think you'd like to be a lawyer. Find a lawyer, talk to a lawyer, ask him what it's like in that work. Or say you want to be a mechanic, go talk to a mechanic, find out what it's like. The clue is what you want to do with your life usually rests around what you like doing anyway. Like if you like doing a thing, that will make that thing work better for you. I've seen people choose a career where they say, oh, oh yeah, that guy a lot of money. He's got this, you know, big fancy car, big house, looks great. I think I'd like to do what he likes to do. Hey, but you don't like doing it. So it kind of sucks. You're doing something that you think will get you a lot of money, but you hate every day. You can't stand going to the office. You can't stand this work. So it's really good to find things in your future that line up with the things you like doing already. So um, the next question is from Cole. Cole writes, I'm fairly certain that I have Asperger's syndrome, but I still need to get a conclusive diagnosis, which is difficult given current events. But one issue I've been having is that my family believes that I don't have it and that no diagnosis is needed despite showing all major symptoms. My sister has gone as far as to say, I'm lying about my condition and that I'm doing it for attention. She claims I'm self-diagnosing even though I've told her that I'm not and that I plan on getting a diagnosis from a professional. It's frustrating trying to get them to hear me out only to be ignored. How should I go about convincing them? You know, Cole, that is really, really a difficult thing to do. Since uh, they've got their mind made up. So when you are talking to someone with their mind made up and you say, I think this thing, and they say, we don't care. Well, I really, really think this thing. Well, we really, really don't care. But I really, really, really think, well, you know what? We still don't care. So it's kind of an emotional thing. The lines of battle are set. So going about convincing them is really tricky. If you've got an uncle who is a psychiatrist specializing in differently wired issues, that uncle might be able to go and talk to his brother or sister and convince them. Somebody like that might do it. However, it seems to me that you could spend a lot of time trying to convince them when uh, you would be better off uh, learning about this condition yourself. There's several resources, various uh, autism organization type people, and they can, um, they can uh, give you advice. There's lots of website stuff. So what to do? I would say don't put so much energy in going about convincing them to do it. Uh, your sister is obviously not going to believe it. I suggest, actually, if you go to her and say, look, here's my diagnosis from Dr. So-and-so. She said, well, I don't believe it. You just tricked them. You're just making it up. Because she's got her mind made up regardless. So you're going to have to kind of steer your own ship a little bit on this and find help that way. Okay, that's it for the mailbag from this week. I see I have somebody waiting in the waiting room, so I'll let them in and see if we can get live on this one. Hello. I see you're muted, so you'll need to unmute. Um, okay. Hi. So I thought about the topic of, you know, self-reflection, and I've been doing that lately. I see you're muted, so you'll need to unmute. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Okay. Hi. So I've been I thinking. Topic of, you know, I think you've got some machinery playing back there. Maybe you should. Uh, 
turn off other can things. Now? I can hear you now. Um, okay. so, so I've been thinking, so I've been thinking about, uh, the, uh, I'm hearing multiple noises. Yeah, me too. Do you have, um, uh, can turn you, do you, can you turn off the stream while you're talking? I'm sorry. I just turned it off. I was having struggle turning it off. Okay. Uh, no problem. So I've been thinking think about self-reflection. Like I've been self-reflecting about, uh, my, you know, my conditions and stuff. And I seem not to have like any, I have some of the symptoms like, so like I can, I have the symptoms. I just don't, they don't appear as often and aren't important when I'm in a different place. Like uh, my aunt's house, I don't have most of the symptoms and I can act normally most of the time. But when I'm at home, I can't seem to do that. Hmm. So, so in your aunt's house, you, you have a different way of responding or a different feeling? Um, they just seem to be more accepting. Like when I'm not, when I'm confused, they don't say like, you know better or you know what I, did, you know what I mean? So I've been thinking about ways that I can help myself, you know, after this virus thing because my family probably has it right now. So... Uh, and I'm stuck in my aunt's house for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've been wondering what could I do when I could get back to, you know, be better and uh, act uh, better and, you know, improve myself. What are the kinds of things that you do at your aunt's house that um, work really well? Uh, you know, that I she do likes not sure. Uh, one thing that I like about it is that I have more people to talk to, like my cousins, my aunt, uncles, both like multiple, and I can visit my other uh, my other uncle's house when I need when I want to, mm -hmm. and I can take care of the little kids. And that's. That, that feels good, and also I feel more less stressed. And when I'm less stressed, I can do more. That I can physically do more. I can carry more things and do more work. So it sounds like you're feeling more productive when you're at your aunt's house than when you're at your own house. Yeah. If, because I've been thinking about ways that I could be better. Uh, I, I actually saw my other cousins from a different house. They argue worse than my me and my sister do, and we argue not, you know, we get on each other's nerve. Mm -hmm. I've understood, uh, though, that because she has a lot of the stuff that my mom has, uh, the clinical depression and uh, general, uh, not generalized anxiety, I have that, uh, social anxiety, that I understand more of what gets on our nerves after talking with uh, these two brothers and sisters that, you know, they love each other, but they have a harder time with each other than me and my sister. I mm. mean, how I can do better because I see the problems in theirs. And I think maybe I could do some stuff that I see wrong with them. Well, I'm wondering about this doing of stuff. That seems to be a key issue. When you're at your aunt's house, you can take care of things. You can do chores. Uh, you can take oh. care of the small people. I can so do I'm bigger chores. I can do like I can I can clean my room. I can do I can do simple stuff, but I get exhausted more because when I do something small that bugs my mom and dad or brother or sister, mm -hmm. they, they react more. So I'm wondering what uh, you can do positively at home that. Uh I thought of one thing. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. My when my sister uh, gets on my nerve or pokes me, which I, or you know, does something like that, I ask, please, instead of getting all upset at her, I just say, please stop, and I won't argue anymore, and I'll just talk to my mom and dad. Ah, uh, so you're diffusing the situation. That's good. Th that's my idea. I haven't been with my sister in like a month because I've been you know, at my aunt's house. And hmm. 
uh, my family probably has the virus, so I'm probably not going there anytime soon. <laughs> so, right. Uh, that I've been self-reflecting about stuff like that, about my anxiety, because I don't seem to have it as much. Uh, I have people around, so uh, bye. Thank you. Okay, so if anybody else wants to join, by all means, hop in. Uh, Self-reflecting can help you become a different person slowly, slowly, slowly. Uh, we can use the concept of neuroplasticity to kind of redesign our brains and the way around us. There's a, a lovely book by Barbara Arrowsmith Young. Uh, she became famous and she wrote a book called The Woman Who Changed Her Brain. So you're not stuck locked in a brain uh, that won't change or can't change. You're not stuck. You don't have to be a prisoner of those things. She writes, why are educators still telling parents that learning disabilities are lifelong? Given the great weight of evidence for neuroplasticity, why are cognitive exercises not more widely recognized as a treatment for learning disabilities? We now take it as a given that the brain is inherently plastic capable of change and constantly changing. The human brain can remap itself, grow new neural connections, and even grow new neurons over a course of a lifetime. When I went to university in the 1970s, I was taught that the brain was fixed. What you were born with is what you lived with all your life. This belief that a learning problem is a lifelong disability had major implications for education and learning. Education, was about pouring content into a fixed system, the brain. At one point, it was argued that there were critical periods in childhood when the brain could more efficiently learn. Once this window closed, such learning became more difficult. At best, then the brain was seen as a fixed system with brief periods of malleability. Well, now we know that's not the case. The brain is not a fixed system. The brain can work and learn at any age. That's why thinking and then self-reflecting can lead to new understandings, new ideas. Lots of things can help with changing your brain, with thinking about how you think, thinking about how you react. And also, I believe it's important to recognize when you have a, an emotion, that's not evidence of a good decision. When you have an emotion, that's a feeling. It may be a good feeling. It may work out, but you can't, it's not data that you can necessarily uh, make great decisions about. You know, somebody says, this is a great car, works well. You say, oh yeah, the color. Oh, well, color could be a big problem, but it may not be. So it, it's okay to think about putting things in priorities in order. So I like this woman who changed her brain. Another uh, author that I enjoy a lot. Oh my goodness, I see a super chat. Thanks for the show, John. I love to write about my day before going to bed. That helped to reflect and then on the future on myself and others. Diego, that is excellent. 50 Mexican bucks, thank you very much. And uh, you make a wonderful point that I hadn't thought of right now, but reflecting is absolutely helped by crystallizing your thoughts in writing. Uh, lots of people do journals, lots of people make notes and they find it wonderful. I know people who've been doing that their whole life. It's also a nice way to work through something that's very troubling. You make a few notes, write a few things. Oh, what if the pros and cons, write this down. What happens if I do this? When you write it down, you kind of see what you think. That's very helpful. Thank you for that, Diego. I will turn to Gabor Maté, who wrote a book, uh, Scattered Minds, The Origin and Healing of Attention Deficit Disorder. Very sensitive book about the brain, about the mind, about how you treat yourself. Uh, he's a very bright man. Um, he spent many years working on Vancouver's east side, downtown, 
uh, where there was an awful lot of people struggling with addiction. So he came away with a deep knowledge of that problem of addiction. He writes, developing a new view toward oneself is no easy task for it goes against the grain of a lifetime of conditioning. It is not a matter of so-called positive thinking or the naive affirmations exemplified by vows like, today I will be kinder to myself. It requires the shedding gradually of defenses constructed long ago, sheer necessity. Defenses maintained out of anxieties embedded in implicit memory. Needed are both a desire to accept the self and the courage to look honestly. Beyond that, the ADD adult also has to acquire the skills of self-understanding. The first of which is the capacity to notice each time she makes a critical judgmental comment against herself. To notice whenever she is seized by anxiety. To notice when her behavior does not jibe with her long-term goal. What's happening here is your brain is being buffeted about between reason and emotion and all kinds of internal distractions and external distractions. I really like that he says, naive affirmations. Today, I will be kinder to myself. That's a struggle. It is a struggle that creates resistance. So somebody says, oh, just be be kinder to yourself. Oh, just do this. That actually creates a kind of a, in, in your, uh, in your uh, spirit, it, ca it, ca it creates a reaction. It, it's not good. Somebody's feeling depressed. Oh, cheer yourself up. This is really a, a, an insensitive way to treat the problem. Now here, what I'm implying here, or what I'm saying here, is that the person, you, are being unkind to yourself. That's not efficient. It's not efficient to be unkind to yourself, but saying being kind to yourself won't work. You've got to unpack it. How do you do that? You have to think about it. You have to sort of study it up and down. Uh, you have to think about it through and through. People say, I am my own worst enemy, a person will complain. Why do I care so much about what the others think? Why do I do something? like that when I know it never worked anyway. You can ask those things in a tone, he says, of compassionate inquiry, part of your self-reflection. Going on a little further, um, one of the things worth thinking about deeply is feeling frustrated with your self for not being where you think you should be. You may look out at the folks that are your age mates, and you say, oh, they're so much farther ahead than me. Oh, they have more money than me, or this, or that, or something. So it actually can work against us when we, you know, wallow in that sensation. All right. Um, if you want to go further in the direction of healing, you do not chastise yourself forever, wherever you happen to be along the road. You don't berate yourself for not having got there faster. Somebody might say, I can't believe how much time I've worked my life, is a refrain often heard in the literary, litany of self-judgments uttered by the ADHD adult. Here I am finding out in my 40s what I should have known as a teenager. The self-reflecting, the awakening is not sudden. It is gradual and occurs in stages. Someone may have meandered down side paths, sleepwalk onto many dead end corridors. He pays for each mistake and unfortunately so do others. None of that could have been avoided. Whatever happened, happened. All of it had to happen, not only for him to find the right direction, but to know he has found it. So Gabor Mate, uh, above all, uh, points to the need for uh, compassion for yourself. I find in the world of the differently wired, many folks have lots of compassion for others, but not quite enough of those. Being that self-reflection can lead you towards saying, well, wait, you know, that mistake happened. I learned about it. It's too bad. I'm sorry it happened, but I don't have to live inside that mistake forever. Now I'm going to turn to the chat room and see if there is... Oh, thank you. Sarah G says, bravo to John for stepping in for the dual role this week. Although we do miss Max. 
Sarah G, not as much as I miss Max. It's it's funny how the energy that two and Max and I have is so much more lively than me just rambling on and on and on. But you know what? Max insisted we have to have the show if it's at all possible, and he's right. We want to keep this thing alive and going because of the, the you know the purpose that we all have. Um, Jenny Forty G Two says I experienced this a lot. Always thinking about how I'm not where I want to be in my life. Good for you. Good for you for thinking about it. And what you need to do, I think, is step back from uh, blaming yourself for any part of it as much as you can. Okay. You have to accept responsibility for the decisions you made, Jenny. But you don't have to keep feeling blame or shame about them. Okay, you made that choice, that didn't work so well, and it didn't get you to where you wanna be. All right, call a break on that. You have this platform you're gonna work from. You're gonna say, okay, this is where I wanted to be. I'm not there. Erase that. Where am I now? This is where I am now. What are the steps to move me to where I wanna be? Now, um, we often say on this show, those steps, can be tiny winchy steps, but you're pointing your nose in the direction of them. So I'm just thinking that uh, that kind of, how should I say, positive, active approach based on intended action helps you set an implementation to get you forward. So uh, I'm gonna look a little bit more on the chat stream. Oh, Jenny G also says, what about neuro, neurogenesis, neurogenesis? I've read a, article, a lot of articles about how we develop the neurons in our brains by doing different things. For instance, meditation, which can be another form of self-reflection. Well, meditation is wonderful. And there are a lot of great meditations around. And there's some good evidence that meditation helps, of course, calm people. It helps people sleep. It helps people with focus issues. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of people think meditation is sitting in a room being really quiet and not moving for a long time. And for some, it is that. But um, if you're a person who has trouble sitting still and meditating, I would recommend you could try uh, something guided such as John Kabat-Zinn's uh, body scan. It's about a half hour meditation where he talks you through a process. And you don't have to work hard at not thinking. But that's the big struggle people have with meditation. So how can I not think? There's this thought coming in and I have trouble letting it go and so on and so forth. So, okay. Um, still looking in the live stream. If anybody wants to come on the show live, you can click on uh, the, the link, Zoom link. Prison of our own mind. That's why trauma is a hard beast to slay, says Emerald Queen. Uh, yeah. Trauma is a very, very special hard beast to slay. The um, A couple of years ago, I went to a conference in Boston about trauma. It's going on again this year, pretty soon now, but it's going to be a virtual conference. Um, in it, they spoke, uh, Bessel van der Kock is the chair of it, and uh, all, all the people spoke about the effect of childhood trauma, sustained trauma, uh, sometimes called developmental trauma, uh, for developmental PTSD. Now, PTSD used to be thought of as something that soldiers got exclusively or people involved in vaccines. We now know there's a very large number of people who suffer from traumas that could be have, could have happened very very early in life and could be sustained and could be something that was simply a nasty kind of recurring event going on. And 
Emerald Queen, we don't even know sometimes where they come from. The folks in Boston uh, have several different treatments. So uh, for dealing with trauma, EMDR is one of the popular ones, eye movement desensitization, uh, a process whereby people talk about things, wave their arms in front. I, I don't know how to do it. I've seen it done. Uh, you can, look, if you're interested, you can see YouTube videos of people doing EMDR. Uh, it's interesting to watch. Uh, another um, therapy is sensory motor psychotherapy, which is uh, where the therapist, and you need to be specially trained to do this in, in this type of therapy, the therapist uh, gets you through a process whereby you remember the images of the bad stuff as memories rather than memories in your body. So sensory motor psychotherapy talks about how the body and the mind affect one another. And the therapy has to sort of locate where this pain is coming from, recognize it, and work through a process of letting you keep the memory, the photograph of it in your mind, but not having just the same physical, emotional reaction to the memory. It's kind of tricky stuff. I see uh, Jenny says, I think it's important to remember that we are not our thoughts, but observers of our thoughts. Very good point. So our thoughts come from inside. They, we form them. They're hidden in the brain. As we Actually, that's a really good point underpinning self-reflection, Jenny. We are observers of our thoughts. And it's interesting because when our, when our brains are not working very well at all, we can have all kinds of thoughts that don't connect, and we might say things that don't make much sense and wander all over the place. Okay, I'm looking in the live stream to see if there's any other people who have said something. Okay, so now I'll turn to an, a text by Louise Hay. Uh, you can heal your life. We can change our attitude toward our past. This carries on from our talking about the trauma. The past is over and done. We cannot change that now. Yet we can change our thoughts about the past. How foolish for us to punish ourselves in the present moment because someone hurt us long ago. That's what kind of happens, doesn't it? We tend to punish ourselves. Someone hurt us long ago. And here we are punishing ourselves for it, partially just by thinking of us ourselves in a negative way. I often say to people who have deep resentment patterns, please begin to dissolve the resentment now when it is relatively easy. Relatively easy. Don't wait until you are under the threat of a surgeon's knife or on your deathbed when you have to deal with panic too. When we are in a state of panic, it is very difficult to focus our minds on the healing work. We have to take time out to dissolve the fears first. Tricky stuff. If we choose to believe we are helpless victims and that it's all hopeless, then the universe will support us in that belief. In other words, it'll be true. If you believe it's hopeless and you can't do it, you'll be right. It's hopeless. You can't do it. And we'll just go down the drain. It is vital that we release these foolish, outmoded, negative ideas and beliefs that do not support us and nourish us. It's important that we release these foolish, outmoded, negative beliefs. So uh, I think that's a great point. Uh, if we think we are helpless victims, then we will be. If we think we're not, it's possible we can revamp. How, the life, how our life works out. Looking back uh, in the live chat, Diego says, a bath or a shower can also be a good time to reflect. 
that works for me, also put on some good music. Interesting point. The neat thing about a bath or a shower, it's almost like going to get your hair done, or a haircut or something. Someone else is, is working on the problem. There's a routine in place. You don't have to do everything. You can kind of relax and let your mind go because you're getting a haircut, you're getting a shower, you're getting a bath, whatever the case might be. Uh, good time to reflect. Good time to relax. Almost meditate, although you don't want to slip in the shower and crack your skull. Um, okay, Emerald Queen says, I have PTSD. I tried EMDR and it didn't work. A PTSD therapist just had a session with her today. Great. Um, I had a colleague once who was having emotional issues and he he had to go to six different practitioners before he found one that sort of clicks with him. It's really interesting how quite competent people may not be exactly right for you. So you need to be a little bit hopeful and give it another shot. I know it's hard. Oh, my God, I know it's hard. Uh, you know, medical structures, helping structures are kind of spread out and sometimes not rational and sometimes hard to find. So the, the hopeful belief I have is that people who need to find help won't give up after a few missteps or, or what should I say? Mm, not so good choices. Good for you, Emerald Queen. Uh, by the way, it is possible that someone might mention EMDR to you again and you might give them another shot. I don't know. I don't know enough about EMDR to know if different practitioners would have different effects. I suspect it might. I just suspect, but I, I'm not expert at EMDR. I'm not actually a therapist at all. I just have I've seen it done on stage and, and, and uh, on YouTube and so on. But good for you. You're seeing a therapist today and you just had to say, I hope it went well. I hope there's a, you should be able to come away from a session with a helping person feeling hope or how should I say, a sense of getting somewhere. So I, I hope that happened for you, that you got a sense of getting somewhere. And I see Stranded360 says, Darren, PTSD is a very difficult thing to treat. Yes, it is. Be patient with yourself, Emma Queen. In fact, we know it's really, really difficult to treat, especially when it's that soldiers type stuff. Well, actually everybody. But um, in Canada, there's a lot of efforts being made to find processes whereby they can deal with very dramatic and fatal PTSD conditions. It's, it's, it's life and death. It isn't funny. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Annabelle A says, I have trouble finding time for self-reflection. It's an excuse, I know, but fact, well, good for you. Now, sometimes, Annabella, what we do is we locate a time to do something when we're doing something else. What? Yes, when we're doing something else. There may be a time when you're engaged in an activity that has a lot of automatic stuff in it. I don't know. It might be driving down a highway or something. It might be uh, sitting on public transit. It might be some walk in the woods time when you're on your way somewhere. So it's sort of like if you can piggyback a little bit of self-reflection um, on something else that's going on, that, that may be a way you can work it in. Um, if you have no time to think about things, that's worth thinking about. It must be it must be that you're really, really, really busy. Uh, I wonder, is there something that you're doing that you could do less of or, or else could do? Hmm. Thank you for that wonderful question. Midnight says, actually, what I find to be best about showers is the sound of water. I can sort of phase out listening to it, and that's what helps me reflect things in the background. Interesting you should bring that up. Many, many of the machines you get 
the people get uh, to help them sleep are have water sounds in them. So good, thank you. Um, and I will end on a comment from Emerald Queen. My session, this my session was great. Thanks, the therapist is a little related. Fantastic. Good for you for finding that person. And thank you, folks, for putting up with me. We'll cross our fingers that Max is feeling better next week. If not, we'll have other guests and so on and so forth. So, good night, everyone. See you next time. Bye bye.